Welcome everybody. Hope you're doing great. I'm so excited to be here with everybody. I'm proud to be able to introduce and be a part of the FAI conference and a host of today's session. I've, my name is J.R. Burgess and I've been a part of the FAI board for several years now and been to numerous events and spoke at the events and I work with physician practitioners that are looking to integrate medical fitness health coaching, nutrition as a foundation that can make a difference in healthcare. And today we are gonna talk a, about a component uh, that is so critical for the integration to occur, that we need solid exercise program, the ability to work with somebody, to progress them safely, minimally invasive, and work in conjunction with physicians, or be able to help your clients independently, safe, progressive training that makes a difference. And I'm excited to introduce Dr. Phil Pliske, is an Associate Professor of Physical Therapy and Director of Residency Programs at the University of Evansville. He also serves as a consultant for collegiate, professional, industrial, and soldier athletes to transform their performance in injury prevention systems. He's very passionate about changing lives by optimizing performance and preventing injury using a practical research-based approach to musculoskeletal health. He received his master's degree of physical therapy from the University of Evansville and his doctorate of science degree in orthopedic physical therapy from Rocky Mountain University of Health Professions. He's board certified clinical specialist in orthopedics through the American Board of Physical Therapy Specialties, a certified athletic trainer, a certified strength and conditioning specialist. He developed the Y balance test, a simple yet thoroughly researched way to identify motor control deficits. His peer reviewed articles have appeared in numerous scientific journals as he serves as a manuscript reviewer for several publications. His current research is focused on comprehensive movement testing and interventions in athletes, military personnel, and school aged children. Phil is also the founder of Professional Re Rebellion, a community dedicated to helping people create the career of their dreams. Thank you, Dr. Phil. Please take it away and awesome. I appreciate your expertise in helping so many people. Fantastic, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, just glad uh, to be able to, to talk about this important issue. It's so, uh, it's so great to, uh, what we can do as physical therapists, rehabilitation providers and fitness professionals, we have the opportunity to impact lives. So. This is a really important topic, so I'm, I'm super excited to talk about it. One of the things I wanna start off with though, is I just wanna start off with a few questions. I want you to right now, imagine your ideal client. What does that person look like? What, uh, what would it be? You know, could, could you just describe that person for a second? Just really kinda, kinda go in, dive in deep there. Once you have that person in mind, could you imagine seeing those people, that type of person all day long, like that is your ideal uh, person. You get to see that person over and over again. And then finally, can you imagine having engaged clients who are willing to pay for your expertise? And, and especially during a pandemic. And I want to tell you, though, really and truly, by the end of this presentation, I want you to feel how you can actually achieve this and how screening can actually do that for you. So the, before we get to that, there is another problem, though. There is a current literal uh, healthcare crisis. There is a musculoskeletal crisis. Think about how many of your clients or patients have pain, right? Low back pain, shoulder pain, neck pain, knee pain. The, it, it, the musculoskeletal pain is even more prevalent than diabetes, and, and it, it's like 50% of people at any given time are reporting that they have musculoskeletal pain, and these are the people that we're seeing. And a lot of times, these are people who have completed a rehabilitation process or have been through their physician and come to personal training or fitness with this pain still existing. And so we want to look at this, even this trend of exercise related injuries. So in the past 10 years, exercise related injuries, so non-equipment exercises and strength training uh, activity has increased. The number of injuries has, has just gone through the roof. 
And you know, this is this is what we do for a living, and yet this is still happening. So why is this? And you know, we think about one in five people live with a musculoskeletal condition, and one in three seek care. And again, twice as many people are affected by a musculoskeletal condition than they are by diabetes. This is a health epidemic. And the problem is that it increases healthcare expense. Now we're working with insurance companies because uh, musculoskeletal pain, musculoskeletal care has now exceeded other systems, cardiovascular, and you know, so you think of like heart attacks and strokes and things like that. Musculoskeletal healthcare has exceeded the cost, so now insurance companies are interested in decreasing that cost. Secondly, there's no process, there's no accepted process currently to identify risk factors like we do with all the other systems. We know how to check vision, we know how to check the cardiovascular system, but we don't have those that process or those standards to be able to understand what's going on with the musculoskeletal system. So here's what the current model looks like. Uh, the current model is someone's doing what they love and you know, what are the, whether that's working out, working in the yard, playing with grandkids, whatever, then they have some sort of injury or pain. Now they can't do what they love to do. So many times they then seek some sort of treatment for that uh, pain. And it may or may not go, go away. They go again to try to do what they love. Even quicker this time, they're debilitated by that pain. So they stop doing what they love and their fitness decreases. And, and it's, just, it's just a really bad cycle. So the question is, whose fault is it? Because is it the, the medical system, the rehabilitation process that's not rehabilitating people fully? Or is it fitness? Like we talked about, the exercise-related injuries are going through the roof. So who's, who's, who's to blame here? And really, we want to get away from that blame game. We really want to get away from the concept that, that it is someone's fault in particular. It really is the, it needs, we need to change the system. So we need to look at a next generation model. We need to look at a model that puts us into the future to keep people healthy. We know that, that musculoskeletal problems are, are huge. They cost money. They change people's lives. So if we can go in a process that someone's doing what they love, and then we identify the risk factors for them potentially developing an injury or pain, improve those risk factors, that keeps them doing what they love. So without interruption, if we continually monitor these risk factors. The problem is though, a lot of times it's, it seems very complicated to, to monitor risk factors or complex uh, to identify the risk factors to musculoskeletal health. So what we've really done is we've taken literally decades of experience with working in professional sports, collegiate sports, and then the military uh, which then provided us some really great insights. We've, we've been doing research in the military for the past 10 years, and it has really gotten to this point now that we have an actionable plan for clients and therapists and fitness providers to be able to uh, help stop this problem. So what can a movement screen do for you? You know, I, I think you know, a lot of times we think movement screenings has to be complex. It has to be time consuming. I want you to take that off your mind. What if you could do an instantaneous movement screen? Someone goes in a phone booth, a minute later, uh, you have an idea of what's going on. Well, first of all, it gives an appreciation for how a person's moving. This is really important because I think a lot of people, when we do movement screening, I've made this mistake in the past, I really care about movement a lot and I really care about how someone's moving because I know it's going to impact their ability to absorb, if you will, the exercise prescription I'm giving them. You know, it, if they have painful movement patterns or poor movement patterns, do, doing their cardiovascular fitness or their strength uh, training, it can really impair that. But most people don't have that appreciation. If we give people a movement screen that they do on their own or do with us, they can get a better appreciation for the things that they can and can't do. 
when they do that, it causes them to ask the question first. And it's really important for them to ask a question. We can say, hey, you can't do this. And it's really important because that's not going to get us the buy-in that we need. We need the person to be able to do some movements and be able to say, huh, I didn't even realize I couldn't do that. Why can't I do that? Can other people do that? Is this normal? Because we all like to kind of compare ourselves to normal. And that's what we can really do now with a high quality movement screen. So then, so that helps the buy-in. It then identifies, this movement screen can identify risk factors for the user to improve. So then we know that these risk factors are related to injury. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we can identify those risk factors before problems occur. And then they can understand how the person is doing, they can feel it themselves of when they're improving and how it affects their life. And finally, it gets them to their best next step. One of the reasons that we really look at this is people try fitness and usually get injured. That, that's just the, the, the most common thing. We're going to do a couch to 5k, end up getting injured. We're going to start any kind of program. We saw that statistic there. People are getting injured by fitness. And so we want them to take the next best step, which is likely getting with a professional. Maybe not. Maybe they're doing great. And we don't need everybody seeing a professional, but this will help us categorize which people need what. So musculoskeletal health screen empowers patients and clients to take control and optimize their movement. That's our goal. We want healthy people who are engaged in what we want them doing and that they get the results that they want. So I think many of you are familiar with the functional movement systems. I think it's important. I always uh, do, uh, when I do talks, I always want to make sure we're all on the same page as what we're trying to do. The definition of a, of a screen versus a test versus an assessment. A screen, because we're going to be talking about a movement screen here. Uh, if you most commonly known functional movement screen, this is just to test check risk. Okay, this is not an assessment. An assessment is a detailed evaluation performed by a medical provider, healthcare provider, to come up with a specific diagnosis. A screen is just designed to say, hey, are there any big problems here that we need to be aware of that will impact what we're doing in the future? And then there's a test. Examples of that are the Y balance test where we're looking at just getting a number from that. A test doesn't require judgment. It just gives you a number. You can think blood pressure, heart rate, uh, cholesterol levels. Those are all tests. It's not a judgment. It's just, hey, this is what the number is. You're either, you're either pass or you don't. And uh, that's the difference in a test. So I think it's really important to understand that what we're going to be doing here, what I'm going to be showing you is along the lines of screening. So we're going to be checking risk factors. So why do we why are we here why do we know this well this all started with injury prediction in sport we looked at using movement using balance testing and identified that you, we can identify these risk factors in athletes. We can predict who is going to get injured, who is more likely to get hurt and lose time from their season. Well, we also found out that the presence of risk factors in our military studies reduces physical performance. You can't run as fast uh, or do as well on, on physical performance tests if you have these musculoskeletal risk factors. And then finally, the number of risk factors that you have really increases your risk for injury. And this is where it starts off talking about, hey, can, you know, this was our, our first study back in 2007, looking at the functional movement screen and injury prediction. At this point in time, we even had said in this article, the functional movement screen isn't everything for injury prediction. It's just one piece and needs to be incorporated into a multifactorial model. And then we looked at uh, can we uh, can we see all of these things in different populations, and then can we improve them? You know, so it's fine to identify risk factors, but does it matter? And the answer is yes, you can improve risk factors. So I want to talk though. Once we started with individual risk factors like the Y balance test, like the functional movement screen we knew that certain risk factors were more important than others and having more risk factors probably changes your risk as well. So we developed an algorithm 
that weights different risk factors, weights the number of risk factors, and looked at putting those risk factors together and ident putting people into categories. Categorization is so important because you know, if you look at blood pressure, when it's uh, a single risk factor, it, there's categories, right? There's, there's, you know, you have borderline or, or pre, you're pre-hypertensive or you're hypertensive or you are actually in a, in a medical emergency, a cardiac emergency because your blood pressure is so high. And it's important to kind of think about musculoskeletal risk factors much in the same way. And so this was uh, when, when after someone is tested with functional movement screen, the Y balance test, previous injury, uh, we looked at the symmetry on those things, score, pain, it gets calculated, the person gets categorized. And what we found in, uh, in athletes was those people who were in the two high risk categories, the moderate and substantial, were three and a half times more likely to get hurt during that season. And this is what really started us on this categorization process. Because if you're three and a half times more likely for a non-contact injury, we know these muscular risk, musculoskeletal risk factors are important. So then we look at this, the military got involved and said, hey, we've got a lot of people that, that uh, musculoskeletal is one of our number one reason for uh, seeking health care in the military. It's the number one reason for limited duty days. It is costing us a ton of money and affecting our readiness. And so when we looked at this and putting this in the military population, we applied the same information. What I want you to see here is you'll see the second study there is with Army Rangers. And that's what people think about when they think about the military. They kind of think of that frontline combat related person. And that's really important. But there's also several other groups. And so we published a study and we separated out the Army Rangers because they're a different group. Now, when we looked at uh, when we looked at combat, combat service and combat service support, let me give you a quick definition of what those are. Combat uh, is what you would think, frontline uh, soldiers. When you look at combat service, these are people who are involved in the front line but aren't necessarily in combat, meaning these are uh, you know, your, uh, your mechanics, your uh, cooks, your people who are in maybe, maybe even in a forward area, but they are not necessarily in, in the battle. They are the people who are supporting that. And then there's combat service support. And these are all your front line, or excuse me, not front line workers. These are your, tend to be more of your desk jobs, your administrative jobs. When we publish military studies, I think a lot of people just make the assumption that these, these are high level athletes. That's not true. It actually, the military represents the average population more so than, than most average population studies because there's usually actually a higher rate of smoking uh, in those than uh, that the people smoke in the military. So. I want you to think as I talk about these risk factors that this is average population risk factors. So we did a 1,450 soldier study, uh, tested everybody on just about every conceivable risk factor that you can imagine. Uh, hundreds of survey questions about lifestyle and, and biopsychosocial factors. And uh, then we did a bunch of testing. And so this is what came out. It, we followed these people out for a year to see who got injured. If they had been injured uh, before, if they had said they had been injured in the past year, if they had been off duty in the past year, they were more likely to get hurt. If they had, uh, if uh, I wanna talk about the SANE score for a second there. If they said they had an injury and were less than 92% recovered. So the SANE question asks, on a zero to 100 scale, what percent do you feel recovered? Zero is I'm not recovered at all. 100% means I'm good to go, I'm fine, there's no problem at all. And if those people with less than, said they were less than 92% recovered were more likely to get injured. If a person had pain with any movement testing, that was an independent risk factor in and of itself. Also, dorsiflexion asymmetry, upper quarter Y balance test, lower quarter Y balance test, and two mile run time greater than 15 uh, minutes. And so all of these risk factors were found in this huge, huge study that we did. What's interesting though, when you sum all the risk factors, the, the, the risk factors are on the side there of the slide, but if you look at the number, if someone has uh, one or two risk factors, they really don't have any increased risk unless it's pain. Uh, pain kind of trumps everything. 
if they have uh, three or four, they have moderate risk. And if they have five or more, they are mo very likely to get hurt. And that's really important. Uh, we published this in Sports Health in this past year. The interesting thing is, I, I think a lot of people don't necessarily care about getting hurt because basically everyone's invincible until uh, they get hurt. So it's hard to get people to care. What's interesting though, the more risk factors you had, the more your performance decreased. So on things like hopping and push-ups and things like that, you if you had more risk factors, your performance on that decreases. So this is why it's important for us as healthcare and fitness providers of decreasing those number of risk factors. By decreasing the number of risk factors, we think that you can actually increase someone's performance even versus working on their performance. So moving, removing those negatives, removing those risk factors actually can help someone perform better. Better. And as we get older, these risk factors just naturally increase just because of aging, but because of previous injury. So this again is in all kinds of population in uh, firefighter recruits, those people who uh, uh, have a uh, low FMS score, their cost of injury was over double than those people who had a higher FMS score. So what this is telling us is not only that if you uh, have a low score, you're more likely to get injured, but if you do get injured, then you, it's gonna take you a lot longer and be more costly. Uh, and so again, as you people have implemented this in, in just the, in the average occupational setting, like uh, looking at linemen, uh, in in, in uh, the electrical companies, when you implement removing risk factors, you can see how the number of time loss injuries in this cohort went down. So that's that's really important there, which again, the money savings on that. So any of you who are working or want to get working in occupational health, it's really important as well. So I want to talk about though, this is this is kind of right hot off the press. Uh, we presented it this year at combined sections meeting. But looking at, we said, okay, previous injury is, is without a doubt the most robust risk factor for future injury. Meaning if you've been hurt, then you're much more likely to get hurt again. And you kind of say, Phil, well, duh, why would I even be here for you to tell me that? I knew that on my own. If you've been hurt, of course you're gonna more likely to get hurt. Well, we said, okay, let's, let's look at that though. What if we take everyone who has had a, uh, an injury and get them after rehabilitation and follow them for a year and see what risk factors predict future injury. Well, what I'm gonna talk about first is what people look like at the end of rehabilitation. Well, because there's currently no standard uh, discharge or return to duty, return to sport, return to fitness, return to activity procedure. Remember, we talked about that at the beginning. Now, so what do we do? We looked at everything again that we looked at the previous studies, plus added basic movement patterns. So this is not complex. This is chin to chest, looking up at the ceiling, turning, looking over each shoulder, touching your toes and squatting, very basic movements. And we looked at higher level movements. 44% of people who have been returned to duty, they had, they had completed their rehabilitation or medical process, 44% still had pain in one of those movement patterns. And I think uh, all the fitness providers in the room can kind of say amen to that because think about how many people come to you after an injury who have been through rehabilitation yet still have pain. It's a high, high percentage. And you know, a lot of times we say, well, pain should be treated by the, the healthcare provider. Well, the healthcare provider has said, we're done, you're good. And yet now they're coming to fitness and you know, almost half of them still have pain. The other thing is, look at the number of risk factors that were still present after these people completed a good course of care. They, those, those people who had five or more risk factors, 70% of the people in the study had five or more risk factors. If you compare that to people who haven't had an injury or hadn't had an injury or had an injury in less than five years, it's only 43% have 
five or more risk factors and no injury, no injury history, they 7% have five or more risk factors. So musculoskeletal risk factors are so important. And this is important because at the end of an injury cycle, remember we talked about that at the beginning that, that we we're doing what we love and then we get injured and then we try to figure it back out and then we get injured again and we never get back to doing what we love fully is because people appear to be ready but they're really not. There's a crack in their foundation. They have reduced pain. They have normal range of motion, but we're not checking risk factors. We're doing a pretty good job of managing the local problem, but we're not looking at that bigger picture, that global approach. And that's what we want to look at here. This is something that both fitness and rehabilitation can be doing, and it's going to change our ability to help our clients in the long term. So here's, here's some bottom line principles that I want before we get actually into conducting uh, a self-movement screen or a simple movement screen. Everything's connected, right? It doesn't matter if, if I had knee pain. If I had, still have neck pain, that is a risk factor for injury. We're going to look at trying to find the biggest problem and giving people an actionable step. We want to keep it simple. We also want to keep it measurable. We know how to do measurement. And we, we you know, Dr. Kyle Kiesel, one of my colleagues and I, worked, when we were working on this, he knows measurement. That was his PhD training. And so we want to make sure that we're reliable and that we're getting the information that we want. And then we're giving that person an approach or a system to be able to go through. So our goal basically with a self-movement screen is to find the next best step for the person. If the person does it independently, it tells them, hey, you should go contact a fitness person or you should contact a healthcare provider. If you do it with your client, then you can look at it and say, all right, now I, we've done your movement screen, we've done, you've done your simple self screen, you can either decide to go and do in more in depth movement screening or take the information that you gained from the self movement screen and go, all right, they're having pain with squatting. I shouldn't be loading the squat and I probably shouldn't even be working on the squat pattern. But when I look at everything else, everything else is okay. So I've got tons of fitness activities that they can do. But by removing that risk factor and maybe even talking about getting that squat, painful squat pattern addressed, we can keep them in doing what they love. All right. So could you imagine if your clients were proactive in their musculoskeletal health? Could you imagine if they came to you before they had an injury? That's our whole goal. So how do we, how do, we do this? You know, so now we, 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 we believe that you know this is something we should do. How do we use a self screen to identify these risk factors? Well, this actually it, it comes in an app. There's a musculoskeletal skeletal status questionnaire. The self movement screen uh, is a series of tests that well, I'm going to show you here in a minute. A couple clearing tests, some uh, mobility tests, and a breathing screen. And all of this goes into an information to get someone into a category. So the questionnaire just is very simple, talks about previous and current history, body metrics, are they diagnosed with osteoarthritis, and then some biopsychosocial factors, uh, their fear of movement, uh, you know, what other types of things they have going on. The actual screen itself is uh, the toe touch, the deep squat, rotation, shoulder mobility, and a balance and reach maneuver. So you'll kind of see we spent a long time trying to distill down from our different assessments and screens to be able to as simply as possible that someone could do a movement screen on their own at home and be able to uh, identify their best next step. Now, let's talk about what the framework looks like. What does, what does the testing structure look like? And basically what we do is, if, if you're familiar with the functional movement screen, you know, there's a, the concept of a three, two, one, and zero. Zero means you have pain. One means you can't do a movement even with a compensation. Two means you can do a movement, but you have a compensation. And three means you do the movement perfectly. I, I wanna always dispel a, a, a myth out there that, that we're looking for everybody to move perfectly. That's not the goal. The goal on the functional movement screen in most cases is not necessarily a three. It's just simply that you can perform a basic movement with some compensation. And that's all we're looking for. But you'll be surprised how many people can't do that. 
So in the self movement screen though, because this person is going to be doing it on their own or maybe with you in, in coaching, we're gonna start at a baseline movement. Can we do a basic movement pattern? If they can't do a basic, basic movement pattern, we know that that movement pattern is problematic, right? That there, there's dysfunction in that movement pattern. If they can do the basic movement pattern, we're gonna show them an advanced one and just to see where they are. And this will let us help us identify asymmetries and identify their, big, their weakest link, all right? If they can do the advanced movement pattern, their green box there, that's their final score. If they can't, uh, they're, they're kind of in that middle category and that's, that's depending on what's going on, that that's, could be okay. Then we're always gonna ask, is there pain with it? So let's get dive right in here. So the toe touch, the toe touch, we all understand how important a toe touch is, whether it's simple sport, uh, uh, more complex sport, or just your activities of daily living. I mean, the ability to touch your toes is fundamental to what we do as humans. So this is how we do the toe touch here. It's basically, you go into this uh, stride stance position. So kind of a, a little bit of a modified Romberg there, uh, almost a heel toe position, but not in front. And you're gonna reach down and touch your toes. This looks at that the person has appropriate spinal movement as well as lower body mobility and flexibility. So the first, the baseline movement is going to be, can you touch your front toe? And if you guys all want to, I know a lot of times sitting in front of webinars can just be, oh, you get you, you get you crazy. Go ahead and stand up and do these movements while I'm talking about them. You've got your slides, so you don't have to worry about missing anything. Uh, the the first pattern is touching toes. Can you can you go and touch that left toe first, and then you go to the other side? Can you touch that right toe? Then the higher level movement pattern is can you touch that back toe? And this is again keeping that knee basically straight. You know there can be a slight bend to it, but not bending the knees. And we're gonna always ask, did this movement cause pain? Is it, did it hurt at all? And that's gonna give us our score. The next movement is the deep squat. And as we all know, this is something uh, that it, particularly in the United States, we lose as a culture. We don't uh, typically maintain this very well, but it's essential whether in occupation or just ADL to be able to deep squat. I mean, quite frankly, using the bathroom involves it. So we want to be able to test that. And, and here's how we do this with the simple movement screen is you know, basically your feet are together, your arms are straight out in front of you, and then you squat down and that squat, then you bring your hands down and can you touch your fingertips? You'll see this fingertips in the, in, within next to your footprint, okay, next to your feet. And then can you stand back up, okay? And that's the goal, that's, that would be the baseline movement. The more advanced one is can you deep squat and uh, do it with your fists? Again, go ahead and try this. I think it's important to kind of recognize in yourself where you're limited and where you're not because if you don't value this, if you don't value basic movement, uh, it's gonna be hard to get your clients to. So then we're gonna finally, hey, does this cause any pain anywhere? Because if I'm having hip pain, knee pain, ankle pain, back pain with this, we need to know that because that is gonna affect our programming. We can do this quick and easily, and we're gonna transfer this into doing safe programming. The next one is rotation. Rotation, the ability to rotate is also our ability to uh, you know, do all these activities of daily living, but it's also our ability to stabilize our rotation, which is really important as well. Yeah, so we want to uh, have the person with their feet together, and then we're gonna go into that, that stride stance position. And we're just gonna go ahead and rotate. And go ahead and do this right now. Get moving, get, uh, get standing up. You might be sitting at a computer all day. Uh, so it's really important. We're gonna to turn toward that forward foot side and uh, see if we see a side to side difference. They should be able to get to that 90 degree marker. So as we go and turn, can they get to 90 degrees? Can they get uh, perpendicular to the wall there. So the first one, the basic baseline movement, we're just gonna do in narrow stance. Okay, so this is just feet together and then go ahead and rotate. So we're gonna go ahead and turn, get, get to 90 degrees there and then go to the other side and we're gonna turn. If they can do that, if they can get to that 90 degrees, that's when we're gonna do this tandem stance rotation. So in this uh, little split stance uh, movement here, 
what does that look like and can they rotate? And again, we're looking, does this cause any pain? Full symmetrical rotation gives us an idea of the functioning at the ankles, the knees, the hips, the thorax, the abdominal area, and even a little bit into the shoulders. And this is an important thing to know that these movements are full uh, in, even in, in, the, in the most basic position. Then we're gonna look at shoulder mobility. Shoulder mobility in sport is obvious, but in ADL, it's huge. Whether it's combing your hair, reaching to, for the coffee cup on the second shelf, very important here. One thing I want you to recognize though, is that is shoulder mobility is not just about the shoulders. It is also about thoracic extension and rotation, uh, and even maintaining your balance in, in your, with your feet together position. You might be working with some clients who just getting your feet together and doing that movement is gonna cause them to lose their balance. That is going to be a key clue for you. But you can see, you just fold up a piece of paper uh, and you have that uh, eight and a half inch by 11 paper and can you pass it from uh, side to side with the paper? If you can do that, you've passed the basic movement, and then we go on to the more advanced movement, and that is can you touch your fingertips together, so more of that aptly scratch position, uh, and if we can do that, well, that's going to give us a picture of your shoulder and thorax mobility. And then finally, hey, does this have any pain with it? Now we're gonna look at someone's balance. And again, this whole screen is designed to be done without equipment and to be done quickly. We know that single limb balance is so important. And I think if we were to work in this aging population, if we can improve balance, I know uh, Cody talks about this all the time, if we can improve balance, single leg balance, we could change the world. But we have to be able to identify balance first. You know, So what does that look like? This process is going to uh, be able to get the person to their limit of stability. This is based on the Y balance test and uh, the tons and tons of data. We have over 120,000 people who have done the Y balance test and we know what someone should score. Well, this is designed to make it super easy. You can actually do this at a wall. Uh, so basically the person starts out by going one foot length back and touching where the wall and the floor meet, not touching the floor, but just right above where the wall and the floor meet, and they reach out without touching down five times. Then they switch to the other side. If they can do it at one foot length, then we're gonna have them go to two foot lengths. Now, two foot lengths is actually the baseline, but we recognize though that a lot of people, two foot lengths, when you go to that quote unquote extreme, uh, it, it's really not much different than walking, but when you're going to that farther reach, we wanna make sure that people have a good understanding of the test and are safe. So we're gonna start at one foot length. Remember, when you do this, your heel needs to stay down on your stance foot, really important there. Then we're gonna go back out to two and a half foot lengths. So we're gonna step back two and then one half a foot length. And one way to think about that is putting your toes in the middle of the other foot's arch, right? So that, that's kind of that position there. Get to two and a half foot lengths. Can you touch five times on each side? And then you record that, record that score. Then obviously, does this cause pain? If there's pain with this, that's a red flag to us. Then we finish up with two clearing tests, uh, very simply, the uh, press up, which is just the, the movement there, uh, what you're very familiar with, where you, you extend the low back. Low back pain is so prevalent in our population, so important to identify that, uh, whether they have pain with that movement or not. Then the next one is shoulder. Uh, so we're just gonna do a Yoakum's test here. Do we get any active impingement uh, in the shoulder? This is a really important, uh, uh, it's so common to have impingement in the shoulder and it really does affect a lot of our movement patterns. So we wanna know if that's painful. And then we're also gonna do some of the Biden tests. Uh, and this is, this is more on the cutting edge of, of what we're looking at. But uh, these mobility tests will identify someone what we found is some people who are hypermobile still can have a movement or, or stability problem, but their hypermobility actually kind of masks that because they have so much movement that they pass all the self-screen. And that's why this becomes important because if they pass all the self-screen but are positive on these mobility tests, we're going to need to get this person a lot of stability and motor control. All right, so what do the self-screen results of the self-screen mean? It tells us where to start. 
you know, uh, if the person is doing it on their own, so they they just get the app, uh, they they uh, go through it. They can tell us whether we need to get the person to a healthcare provider, we need to get them to a physician or physical therapist or other rehabilitation chiropractor, or other rehabilitation provider. Do they need fitness? Meaning, this is a person who probably has had some injuries in the past, has been injured in fitness before. They need to be with a professional, uh, or do they need uh, to be on their own? But they need programming. They need things to work on, or do they need to keep going uh, to a performance uh, fitness kind of specialist to increase their their performance. So this is what this looks like that when a person does it independently, and hopefully this is what's going to increase your referrals to someone working with you is because you can be a provider on this so that people know, hey, this is where I'm going to go. Uh, again, that, that optimal category that this person needs performance, this person is moving well, we need to work on their fitness. And again, this is where you're, they're going to get workout uh, things. I'm not going to talk to you guys about that. You know how to do that really well. If a person has moderate deficit, this usually means that they need uh, some, some movement correctives along with uh, some, some performance coaching, some fitness coaching uh, as well. And then a moderate deficit, again, this person is probably isn't currently in pain, but they have had a lot of injuries in the past. This person definitely needs one-on-one -on -one training without a doubt, not just, hey, I'm going to set you up on a program and let you go. This person needs their dosage really monitored, also needs their movement patterns, their risk factors to be monitored. And then finally, this person has pain with a lot of their movement patterns, and they, if they have not been seen by a healthcare provider, they need to be seen by a healthcare provider. If they have been seen and have been cleared, well, now the fitness provider is using this information of the painful movement patterns in order to be able to avoid those so that they don't cause that cycle to continue to repeat. So uh, we, the, our whole goal here is we want clients for life, right? We want someone to get set up with us and be able to manage their own risk factors. When they manage their own risk factors, they actually uh, become more uh, 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 attuned to us and more interested in what we have to offer them because we, I've had people who monitor on their own and they're doing fine and then suddenly they either sprain an ankle or they just uh, do their retest and they're like, oh, well, you know, this is not moving as well. I need to get back in with him so I don't end up injured. So this is so important with your clients. It's so important for what you want to do. So remember, this, this move print, the self-screening concept, the goal is to put musculoskeletal health in the hands of the patient, to basically do what we've done with other risk factors like blood pressure and cholesterol. The people may or may not act on blood pressure or cholesterol, but they at least now know it's important and they know when it's bad. People don't have a clue about musculoskeletal health, that there are risk factors for musculoskeletal health, or that it even matters. Well, and then once they are aware, this allows us to connect with our clients in a more meaningful way. It, uh, it allows people to uh, come into us. It's a great lead generation tool because, again, instead of someone just going off and trying to do their own fitness programming, we can help them as professionals. And I'll just finish up with one last thing here is uh, a lot of times we're trying to either uh, do a great community service by giving community presentations or we're trying to increase our client base by doing these community presentations. And, and sometimes we're presenting on different topics. This is a great topic to present on because everybody wants to know how they're doing. So they want to know, how do I compare to other people? And, and am, am I doing well or not? As you saw today, it's so easy to do this uh, self-screening in minutes and you can demonstrate it in front of people and have people stand up and try it right then and then give them a tangible output that says, hey, you know, this, you're doing great. This, you know, maybe we need to work on these areas or maybe we can do some other things that will help you. So uh, I just want to put that uh, additional information in there because I get a lot of questions about that you know, what do I present at a community health fair? How do I increase my clients? This is one great way to do it. 
So uh, in summary, you can empower your patients, you can empower your clients, connect with them, generate the clientele that you love to work with. Could you imagine that? That would be so awesome. The Mooprint system will give the person their next best step, which frequently is going to involve you as a provider. Uh, so there, are, I know I went through a ton of studies uh, in there. As you'll see in your slides, there are, uh, I've listed all those out. If you have any questions, uh, don't hesitate to uh, email me. Uh, again, you can see all of those. Uh, best way to contact me, I actually don't have this up. It was uh, uh, kind, of, kind of a bad uh, thing here. Best way to contact me is at philplisky.com through the uh, contact information. It's P-H-I-L-P-L-I-S-K-Y.com. And uh, you just my, my first uh, and last name there. And just hit contact me and I'd be happy to connect with you, answer any questions that you have. But while you have me here, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to our host. And uh, if there are any questions that anybody has, go ahead and shoot them my way. I'd love to start a conversation there. Great job, Dr. Plisky. Fantastic information. Very informative and I love the, the concept of the best next steps so we can learn how to move patients forward. So I have a couple of great questions coming in. So continue to put those through the chat as we, we have Dr. Plisky here to answer the questions. So the first one comes from Dina. Many of the clients we work with walk in chronic pain. They have a long list of physical issues and pain issues, knees, hips, low back, some hands, some shoulder. She uses an FMS screen in approach. However, that's a big thing to reconcile. If I referred out everyone with pain, I wouldn't have any clients. Can you talk? Hey, Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. And I think that's, um, I think that's what is so important. And I, I, I want to really make that, that message there. First off, good for you for actually screening your clients from a musculoskeletal perspective and a movement perspective. It is so important. And again, particularly as we age, uh, I know for me in particular, we do get more aches and pains and joints just start hurting more. Uh, you know, some, some past sins of previous injuries and, and, and all that just start creeping up on us. One of the things that I think is an important concept is remember that if it's not hasn't been identified by a, a provider, a healthcare provider, and hasn't been treated by a healthcare provider, it probably is very important that that get taken care of because that's kind of like dealing with uncontrolled uh, blood pressure that that the person doesn't know about. Now, if they know about it and it has been treated and they've been, they've been through rehabilitation and all that then you're using then you're going with your screening information to help you with your programming. I agree with you. If we referred every single person out with pain, uh, you wouldn't have any clients because I, I would say it's upwards of 80% of your clients uh, probably have some sort of musculoskeletal pain. That's what the research would tell us. That's what the statistics will tell us. The key thing is what I want the message to be is if it hasn't been taken care of, definitely refer. If, now, that doesn't mean refer and you're not treat, seeing them at all. It means you're referring for that problem and you are still working with them in, the, in a non-painful way to get them healthier because that's the best thing that they can do. Now, if it has already been taken care of, they've been through the system and quite frankly, our system, I don't want to say sucks, but sucks uh, from a healthcare perspective. If they have been through, now you're just going to use that information to direct your programming. You're going to really spend a lot more time focusing and loading non-painful patterns and uh, e either avoiding or easy does it uh, in a lower level posture on your painful ones. So hope that answers your question there. You are right. If you referred everyone, you would have not have a client. Just remember, you're only referring people who haven't dealt with it before. And when you're referring them, you're still seeing them. It's not like refer and do nothing. That's the worst thing for your client. Yeah, I love that. and think that's perfect advice. So in summary, you know, if you haven't found a, a PT or a physician that you have that collaborative relationship with and know that you work in tandem and see the exact value in each other, then I would keep looking. So it's not to refer and lose, it's to refer and be in connection in collaboration. Absolutely. And that person should be referring you not only the person back, but should be referring you other people as well. <laughs> so it should Absolutely. be, be should be a win-win. 
That's exactly what I tell people all the time. It's if you want them to refer to you, you should send a couple of your patients first to show that you're a value and say how you'll do the aftercare. Don't expect them to refer to you without establishing that trust and that you can work in collaboration with them because trust that. is the most important thing. So another question that, that um, I've had is we had, had something similar at our center where we would do a movement screening and we used a PT pain screening that had functional and dysfunctional. So mm -hmm. if they were unassessed, like you mentioned, and they squat and did the pain, it would be to the physician to get assessed and diagnosed. If it was dysfunctional, we would get to PT to give some exercises and then be passed back to them. So it, as a medical fitness center, if you're working in a clientele, that helped us get clients into the clinic to give them that better care to show them that we're working in tandem and we're not in silos like many centers. Absolutely. So my question to you is, have you um, found any collaboration starting points of how you would maybe go to PT, some language that, that may help to show that somebody's looking to collaborate that way or any associations that are working in tandem really well? Where would you sell somebody that's trying to create that relationship, how to begin or approach that conversation? Absolutely. I think the, the probably the biggest thing I would say is I always like talking about the elephant in the room. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big proponent of that. I kind of would start that conversation with, you know what I've found? is a lot of people finish up rehabilitation. Uh, what I found as a fitness professional is a lot of people finish up rehabilitation and then go to a fitness professional and get hurt, okay? Which is true. Now, is it the fitness professional's responsibility that they got hurt or is it the patient's or is it the, is it the rehab providers? Again, we're not gonna point fingers. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you, I'm, I'm gonna lean toward the rehab provider. Uh, that's their problem. But the, uh, uh, and a lot of people get hurt I do some movement screening and things like that. And I really respect what you have to say of what I should be doing, shouldn't be doing so that I know what we can. So can we develop that relationship? Because there are so many people out there that I know are just going to these big box gyms and really not, and, and they're just hurting themselves because they don't know any better or they get put on a program by an 18 year old who's just learned how to do machines and, and nothing else. I mean, that happens in our area, unfortunately, uh, that, you know, and, and, and they get hurt. So I'm here. Is there a way I can help you? And that, that uh, asking if you can help the person, that, that goes a long way. Great. I want to take you one step further and get your insight to this. As many physical therapists and medical professionals haven't been trained in retail medicine like many trainers. So especially due to COVID, especially the lockdowns, fitness has become non-essential in many cases. Yeah. So wh what are your thoughts and insights if uh, a trainer came to a physical therapy clinic? Because I know most of them operate eight to five hours. Mm -hmm. When our physical therapy center we found is they don't make money when they're off hours. So personal training was done usually between the hours of 5 a.m. and 8 a.m. over the noon lunch hour and then 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. So maybe as a trainer, if you're listening, you could go and say you're certified, you understand corrective exercise, movement screening, and offer a, a, a contractor position with them that doesn't cost them anything. Then they'd be more likely to refer to you if you're in their own building and doing some sort of revenue share during the off hours. Have you had any experience or how would, if somebody approached you with that, what would you be looking for in that trainer to have the skills, qualifications, and background to, to allow such a relationship? Absolutely. You know, so first of all, I would look at who I'm, who I'm consulting with. I mean, does, does, the, does the rehabilitation facility respect movement to begin with, right? You know, because if I'm going to go to, you know, traditional rehabilitation, they may or may not respect uh, movement. And so uh, that I wouldn't necessarily start with that place. I would look, I'd investigate and say, oh, wow, these people actually value movement screening. Uh, then secondly, what I would, what, how I would approach that is the idea of, hey, we're, I'm, I'm, I'm going to share this revenue with you. You know, you will be able to uh, get additional revenue and additional clients because the clients I have, 
again, 80% of them have pain or end up in some sort of pain because they overdo it, do something stupid uh, or, or that. So I need a place. I'm looking for a place that I can refer people to. And so, and I wouldn't even talk about the referral to you at that point in time, just talk about like, I need a place to refer people to. And wouldn't it be great if it were the same place that, that we're in this together? I do think you have touched on some one thing. I know throughout the world, we have a lot of, uh, you know, gyms have shut down and, and, and like you said, this is, this is a really, really rough time in the, in the fitness industry. And that's why I think even using these self movement screens, you know, maybe normally you would do a functional movement screen, but if you're doing this virtually, that makes it a little bit more difficult than normal. I hope you can see that uh, these things, even if the person isn't doing it on their own app, if, if you can do this in via Zoom and you can watch the person move, again, that can help you guide that because quite frankly, it's your only, what really became apparent to me is when I started having to see people virtually, movement actually is your only distinguishing factor. And here's, here's what I mean by that, is if you think about it, if someone wants fitness, how are you different than a couch to 5k app or a general strengthening program or a body weight strengthening program? Because they can look that up online and just do it themselves and either it goes well or it doesn't, right? Well, your screening process is actually your largest value to be able to tell the person what they can and can't do uh, so that you really know what's going on there. Because otherwise, you know, what do you, what do you do? You know, like you're, you're just over video, you know, it's like, Hey, what, what, what's going to look on? So that's another way that I would really encourage, you know, broadening your perspective, broadening your services. Excellent. I got one more perspective that could be of value to yeah. how do we go as a fitness professional to essential again, as you've seen in the insurance realm, if they're not cash based, they're done with their 12 or their 20 sessions and insurance won't cover anymore. We called it a physical therapy transition program. And as soon as PT was on that last session, we don't say you're done. We say, thanks so much for completing your insurance. Now we have our physical therapy transition program. So that the first session would be a consult beyond just the movement to yeah. what are your goals? What are the yeah. things that you love? So we do a 20 minute consult and then we would do a, a 20 minute movement screening, which That's was awesome. free and then offer a free training session afterwards based on how they move. So it gave us two opportunities to build a relationship as a personal trainer and then we were able to convert 40% of those people into ongoing programs. So again, you could go do this in the physical therapy clinics. You could offer this and as a value add. And you may say as a trainer, well, I can't get clients. All you're offering is an hour and a half of your time to have an unending, if this physical therapist trusts you, flow in an essential environment. So Absolutely. what would you do your intake if somebody came and did that and gave a revenue split to our last question and talked about, instead of letting these people go and always having to bring in new clients of physical therapy, you keep them for life now in that center. Absolutely. And I've got to tell you, when you said that, it really sparked an analogy and we saw this in healthcare. So if you, if you were to go back, uh, rewind 20 years and even somewhat to some degree, 10 years ago, people spent a long time in the hospital, right? So if you had a total knee replacement, you were in the hospital for one to two weeks. Uh, you know, if you, let alone if you had a heart attack or something like that, you were in there forever, right? Now, you know, uh, total knee replacements are same day surgery, right? Like it's, it's like the perspective because the cost was so much for the hospital. So what happened is they decreased hospital stays and increased nursing home stays. Well, then nursing home stays became expensive. So they decreased nursing home stays and did more home health right? And then did more, you know, and so if you think about where healthcare costs are going, it's the similar analogy that you just gave, right? 
actual one-on-one -on -one rehabilitation is being less and less reimbursed. So if we can provide this transition, this is a golden opportunity. If you can be well-educated and recognize how much of the population has pain and respect that and look at it from a movement perspective, your, your, your revenue and, and, and busyness is actually unlimited. You would be too busy. There's, there's not even enough time to actually get all the people that need to be seen. Wonderful. So tell me a little bit about your belief um, of the trainers that, that you're looking for. Um, many of them maybe just have the, the movement component. What are some mm -hmm. next level skills if you're looking to collaborate with trainers that you're looking, that you put up high on your best next moves of certification or next step? Is sure. it coaching and cueing? Is it motivation, accountability, walking the walk? What are some of those inherent principles you know you have either a PT star or a trainer star that you're going to trust to collaborate with? You know, I think the, the, the number one thing is do they have systems in place? And I, I can tell you, uh, my, my, my uh, sister just had physical therapy the other day, and she's telling me about the visit. And unfortunately, I'm somewhat at an eye roll level. You know, I'm just, she got kind of into the system. And one of the, here's a litmus test for you. If I were to send you someone and the, each person, and this is on physical therapy side or on the fitness side, if I sent you someone with knee pain or wanted fitness and they got very similar things, no matter who they were, uh, again, that's, that's something a monkey can do. You know, like that's something we can do. That's something the internet can do right now. There's no need for anybody you. can do a set or rep. Or yeah, kind. exactly. You know, we can, we can, we can kind of try to, and I'm not talking about load even, I'm just saying, Hey, does it look all the same for all your clients? So do you have a system in place of checks and balances? Are you screening on the front end? Are you screening throughout and how do you know your person is getting better? What measures are you using so you know that they're getting better? If you're working in the geriatric population and you're not doing movement screening and balance screening and very specific balance tests, I, 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 I doubt you're doing a, a, a good job because balance is the number one problem in, in, in the elderly. If we're looking at a fitness population, what performance tests are you doing to look at the elements of performance, not just I'm looking at sports specific skills. So again, it's the system uh, that you have and the test retest that you have to be able to identify what you need to avoid and what you need to do. Wonderful. So you've um, aced and had so much experience with athletes, the military, the profession. Have you found a difference in mindset compared to those like the athlete doesn't just want one training. And I've seen this in physical therapy. Here's your two sessions or, oh, now you can do it at home versus the athlete thinks, hey, if I have to come here six days a week to get back on that field, I, I don't want somebody to tell me less than what I want. I want them to tell me how do I get back to sport faster. And I think as physical therapists, as trainers, sometimes we undersell based on our limitations versus what they're really asking. What have you found in people that maybe we're, we're talking about um, the boomer population here? Should we be treating them like that athlete of what do they want and how fast do we get there? Or should it be, here's your four sessions and now you could do it on your own. What is that yeah. success when you treat them like an athlete versus, you know, somebody that's showing up with their own insecurities of trying to help them do it on their own, which yeah. very few people do as well without coaching, accountability, inspiration, and motivation. You know, I think I, I will tell you, and, and, and fortunately, I've been blessed to, uh, you know, I've, I've worked in the skilled nursing facility, uh, the hospital. Uh, I've worked in outpatient centers that my, my average age of my patient is 77. Uh, and then all the way through that continuum into the military and highest level of professional sport. And it's so funny because no matter where, where I'm at, if I'm in professional sports, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the professional uh, sports folks tell me, oh, gosh, it's got to be so easy to be in the military because they do what you tell them. And when I go to the military folks, they're like, oh, gosh, professional sports has to be so easy because they're so highly motivated. And both are completely wrong. You know, it is it is. And, you know, uh, same thing in, you know, the working with the, 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 the those older folks, you know, like, oh, it must be so easy to work with them because they're so they just want to get back to playing with their grandkids. It's so easy. 
honestly, it is the number one thing. It, you hit the nail on the head. It's about motivation and accountability. And I don't know a person who doesn't need motivation and account. Well, that's not true. I know of very few people who don't who need motivation and accountability. Even the best of us, you know, uh, uh, you know, I get my annual musculoskeletal exam. I, you know, I work with people who who can work with me because we can't be our own a physician. It just doesn't work well. You, you're biased. You think you know what's going on. And then to maintain that motivation, I think we are underselling what our services provide. I, you know, I, I, we have to recognize who our audience is. Yes, there is probably that 10 to 20% of the population that is just totally fine on their own and they're going on. They will never need to buy from us. And, and, and that's fine. We don't even need to worry about them but we need to worry about the folks that we can help transform their lives and show them that we've made that transformation. Goes back to my kind of systems comment. If you can't show someone the transformation, they're not gonna pay for it. You know, and it's not just about weight loss or this, that, and the other. You are going to see transformation in movement before you're gonna see it in weight loss. You're gonna see transformation in movement before you're gonna see it in pain. And so, you know, like I wouldn't take my car to a mechanic that after I got it back, it was no better, right? But if I don't know what's wrong with my car, I need the mechanic to tell me what's wrong and then show me how they made it better. I don't think we're doing a very good job of that in any profession. So my question is to that systems, which is so brilliant, is organized knowledge or knowledge in your head is dead is what they say. Yeah. So when did you recognize, as you said, and, and everybody listening, you're hearing them say system, system, systems. Anybody that's buying an outcome when they work with a coach or with you as a trainer is looking to get back to hiking or getting on their knees, playing with their kids. And we call it a unique branded protocol. You came mm -hmm. up with your proprietary system. The number one goal that your patients want or your clients are how do you get consistent and predictable outcomes? So when did you learn, was this a marketing essential or that you just found that you were getting results when you went them through the things or was it a combination of both through your learning and mentorships that you received to come up with your why process and screening protocol? You know, I'll tell you the, the biggest, <laughs> probably the biggest aha in my career is, yeah, I've spent my career researching injury prediction and injury prevention. And I spent at least 15 years of that time under the false assumption that people care about that. Um, and, 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 you know, like I cared about it a lot. So I assumed everyone else cared about it a lot. Uh, and, and this happened with a, a, a high school uh, baseball player. He wanted to be faster and he had gone to all the national branded type of programs that promise speed and promise agility and things like that and never got better. And I knew that he had a movement problem as the base of his performance problem. Well, interestingly enough, I stopped talking about movement and just started doing movement. And so I did his movement screening, but I also did his fundamental capacity screening, which looks at the elements of performance like power and energy storing and, and things like that. And when I did those side by side, they, they found that he couldn't hop on one leg. All right. But then they went, wait a second. And this is dad and kid went, wait, he can't stand in a lunge position and balance. He can't stand on one leg and step over something. Do you think that's related to his inability to hop on one leg? Like, right? So when I stopped selling it and just showed the data in a way, showed the, the, the you know, it's just like, you know, if you can go and say someone wants, if their goal, like tying their goal to what you said, you know, that, that, that very specific outcome of that, what they want. I want to be able to squat down or get down on the floor and play with my grandkids. Okay. Well, if I, now I can do testing that says, okay, get down on the floor and okay, you can't do it or it's painful. All right. That's one thing. They kind of already know that, don't they? Mm -hmm. But if I can do testing and screening that shows them that they can't even stand on one leg or that they can't even squat down or they can't even get into a split stance position 
which are the fundamental patterns of this goal that they want to get to, it can lead to the aha moment for them. Rather than me telling them what's wrong, let them make the connection. So at the end of the screening, I, I, I've learned to shut up a little bit more and say, what did you feel? What do you feel like was, was did you had trouble with that might relate to your, your main goal, right? So your main goal is hiking. Did you know that you couldn't stand on one leg? You know, and, and if they, you know, you might have to walk them down and lead you some leading questions. Uh, but most of the time, people, people are pretty smart. They kind of go, hey, I couldn't stand on one leg. You know, gosh, that's all hiking is, is standing on one leg over and over again. Maybe that's why I had knee pain. I didn't mean to put us onto a marketing masterclass, but if you're wanting to impact more lives, this is what this is. Hey, Amen. It's, it's, all, it's all sales. Unfortunately, everything we do is all sales. But you, you, how you're selling, if you guys all listen, and what gives me the goosebumps is you're explaining a story and making them have their own aha moment. So you can tell people what to do all along. They should all know they should eat better or be exercising. That's telling people. But when you tie it to their result, you have a system that you've had testimonials to get predictive results, and you can tell a story of somebody just like them mm -hmm. that wants to get it. That is what marketing is. If you're selling the information or how to, you're going to do everything, you're going to lose people all day long. So, you know, I heard my, the story on where functional movement, where I finally went and bought the movement screenings and everything mm -hmm. was when Todd Durkin was talking about LaDainian Thomason. Yeah. He wanted to win the you know mvp in a super bowl and by watching his film how he moved he recognized he didn't move to the left so when he was coaching ladamian and he was going there and he recognized that that got him his first client and started getting him pro after pro after pro when yep. he knew just as much as you and i at one point not yep. just passionate he started telling a story recognizing patterns and then it made ladanian have that big aha moment and that was the game changer so you know, when did you start to tie that all down? And I'm so happy you say that. I, I hear very few doctors say marketing and sales is just value added education. And this is what it takes yeah. to become as impactful yeah. as you want. Where did you start tying your outcomes and your ability to, to understand science and movement with learning how to communicate? You know, I think honestly, it was, uh, I, 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 I used, I'm, I've become an average speaker over time and I used to be a horrible presenter. Um, and so I spent actually a lot of time on communication science and communication science, what it taught me is actually, I, I always, I always, I always, I, I do a, a, a speaking program where we talk about one of the first questions we ask, we say, I say, what is the purpose of communication? And uh, everybody always says to get your point across. Like they, that is the number one purpose of communication. And uh, actually the number one purpose of communication is to change someone else's behavior. It's not even to change their mind because if you don't change their behavior, you really haven't accomplished anything, okay? So once I recognize that whether I'm, tr I'm at a bar and want to get ask someone out on a date or I'm in the, the uh, uh, gym and I want someone to buy into my fitness program, both of those I want to change in behavior, right? I want the person to like me better and trust me to go out on a date or I want the person to like me and trust me to per participate in my uh, uh, fitness program both require behavior change. And so when you look at it from the idea of to get my point across is not the goal, the goal is behavior change. You actually go through the steps of, of what the science says on behavior change, which I always thought was stupid is like, you know, does the person want to change first, right? You know, like that's one of the first steps, you know, are they, are they ready to change? And if they're not ready to change, how do you get them there? And so actually working on my presentation ability, my communication ability, made me recognize that everything I do, even if it's trying to get my kids to do their homework, communication is about behavior change, not about getting my point across. My kids know they need to do their homework. It's about getting them to do their homework. Well, and that is not, that is not telling them to do it. And that is not telling them, you know, that why they should do it. It's having them recognize, oh, I care about this or I don't care about this. It's, it's, and here's why I should. That is brilliant. So thank you, Dr. Plisky. 
fantastic. I'm so oh, thankful pleasure. I got to listen and hear in. And please watch the replay, everybody. This was really good stuff that can take the movement screening, what you want to do, and turn it into helping impact more lives, changing Absolutely. behaviors. So, so thankful we got that time. I don't see any more questions coming through. So fantastic job. Um, you're a little hard on yourself about your communication, your presentation. <laughs> you're amazing. Thanks so Thank much. You. I appreciate it. Well, it was great to, great to talk with everybody. Holler if you have any questions. Uh, I'll be happy to answer them. Take One care. One last time, where do they find that contact? Where yeah, Phil, Pl philplisky.com, P-H-I-L-P-L-I-S-K-Y.com. And uh, hit the contact information there, and I'll, I'll be happy to respond to you. Excellent. Thank you so Alrighty. much. Take care.